We're continuing our study today in Proverbs, uh, dealing with themes as we looked at last time. Today we're going to be looking at uh, a huge theme. I don't know how we're going to be able to cover it in, in 30 minute program. It's, it's the concept of the priority of people. And we put that in the big word, interpersonal relationships, which m simply means how we relate, not only to ourself, uh, but, but to anybody and everybody. So again, I have some opening thoughts I want to kind of uh, share with you that, that kind of give my philosophy of what the Bible says about that. Go into a unique presentation of some of the themes of Proverbs and then have a few closing summary remarks, okay? Number one, God created man for fellowship with himself. Now that shows us something about God. I, I hate to say God's need, but I do think it surely shows God's desire to want fellowship. Man is made in the image of God and thereby needs fellowship also. It's been very interesting to me as I studied Genesis 1 and 2. In Genesis 1, 31 it says, and it is very good, speaking about creation. In Genesis 2, 18 is the first time it ever says that something is not good, and that's when it says it's not good for man to be alone. Boy, that has just wiped me out theologically. Here is God and man in perfect fellowship, walking and talking in the garden. Sin had not entered the world, and man needed more than simply fellowship with God. What a staggering thought. You mean, you mean we're made in such a way that we need something, someone else like us as well as God? Yes, we're social creatures. We must have someone else. And of course, here's where the Adam and Eve comes in, as you know. There is a tension between the appropriate love for self and a love for others. This tension I think goes back to the fall, which is in Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 through 13. I guess the saddest passage in the Bible, God came walking in the cool of the garden to visit with Adam. He had visited with him for we don't know how many years, maybe decades, maybe millennia for all we know. Adam, Adam, where are you, Adam? Now, folks, God didn't need information about the location of Adam. Problem was, Adam didn't know where he was. And this whole scenario, God says, what have you done, Adam? And Adam says, it's the woman that you gave me. <laughs> and then the woman says, it was the snake. Do you catch how man was estranged from himself, estranged from his wife, estranged from his world, and estranged from his God? That tension in our relationship has been there. And yet, I think we have to come back and give a, a perspective on that. Uh, I think too often we say that self-love is always evil. That can't be true. God loves all, he loves us individually first. I think we can say that God loves you is a true biblical statement. But God also loves all mankind collectively. In the book of Leviticus, chapters 19, verse 18, which is so often quoted in the New Testament, the Bible says, you shall love your neighbor, covenant partner, as yourself. Now that implies that an appropriate self-love is mandatory for a proper love for others. This is quoted so often in the New Testament. Mark 12, 28 through 34, Matthew 22, 37 through 40, and, and Paul uses a summary in, in Romans 13, 9. But we've got to love others also. Others, others, our love for others really show our love for God. Here are a few about loving others, not just loving ourselves. 1 Corinthians 10:24, 1 Corinthians 13:5, Philippians 2, verse 2 through the end of the chapter, at least through verse 22. Personal fulfillment is linked to God's larger purpose in our life, which involves us loving the world as he loves the world. Now, in New Testament terms, we'd call this Christ-likeness, but it really is becoming more and more like God. Look at Galatians 4.19, Philippians 2.21. D. Scripture is primarily a relationship book. Now think what I'm saying to you. Scripture is primarily not a rule book or a systematic theology. It is primarily a relationship book. It tells us how God has dealt with individuals. 
And the way he deals individuals is consistent with the way he wants to deal with us and the way he wants us to deal with others. We must see the Bible like that. Um, I think the Bible gives us some guidelines of how we ought to, to, to live toward others. John 13, 34 is probably a classic example. New commandment I give you, that you love one another even as I have loved you. Not self-love only now, but we love others as Christ loved us. Do you catch the, the, the magnification and intensification of even appropriate self-love into God kind of self-giving love? John 3, 16, love for all others, sacrificial, self-giving love. It's very important. The Old Testament and the New Testament must be seen in a progressive, revelatory sense. And the reason I say that is I think we can proof the Old Testament, Testament and really get into some problems. The Old Testament is Scripture. The Old Testament is, is uh, the Word of God, but it must be balanced and informed by the New Testament. I guess the, the classical passage on this would be Matthew 5, 17 and following. Jesus said, Heaven and earth will pass away, but not a jot or a tittle of this law will pass away till all is fulfilled. And then beginning in verse 21 in the next few paragraphs, he says, What you thought the Bible says, it never really said. Here's what it really means. And th those are all personal relationship concepts that he's basically given us there. E. How God acts is how we ought to act. We know uh, God knows men's hearts. And we are not there to relate to others exactly like God relates because we don't know what others think and what others mean, what others' motives are. But we have, to, we, have to, we have to relate to others in a trusting, forgiving way. I guess that's what I want to say. People are priority with God, and they must become priority with us. We, met, we must not let ourselves, our desires, our will, our wants become the center of all things. We are not priority. Finally, I want to give you some categories I think that are helpful. Proverbs forms a unique revelatory model for practical daily guidelines for interpersonal relationships. I want to give you the following categories. Now, I want you to think of concentric circles that move out from each other. Now, let's start with this one. Spouse, children, Parents, relatives, we, we would call that the extended family. How we relate to those who know us best and we are uh, blood related to is the first maybe concentric circles of, of help that Proverbs will give us. Secondly, if we, if we expand that from family to friends, and of course by friends I mean covenant partners, and then to the whole world. How, how do we deal, with, is there a difference between family and faithful covenant partners versus unfaithful covenant partners versus Gentiles. Yes, the Old Testament there is. And then one more, I want to see two overlapping circles. For as we think of covenant partners, we must say that there are some covenant partners that are righteous and some covenant partners that are wicked. There are some covenant partners that are wise and there are some covenant partners that are foolish and we relate different to them. That's the same is true of sons. Some of our children are wise, we relate one way. Some are foolish, we relate another. And uh, I think you need to see those kind of shades or concentric circles as it moves through Proverbs. Now, with that in mind, let me go to some particular categories that I've developed in Proverbs. And I was looking at the Tyndale Old Testament series. It does a, a very similar thing in the introduction. It deals with the family. Uh, it deals with, the, with the, the neighbor, the friend. It deals with the sluggard and the fool, the scoffer. And so this is a very little helpful introduction. Uh, this one is one that I've come up with. You would come up with another one I know as you read through this and tried to put it in themes. But this may help you as a way of us thinking through it together. The first would be uh, Proverbs principles on personal relationships. Number one, between God and man. That's the first most unique relationship that needs to be in place. And Proverbs, it amazed me how many times it says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's in chapter 1, verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Uh, you might want to see chapter 9, verse 10. And I also want to read chapter 14, verse 26 and 27. Listen to this. In the fear of the Lord, there is strong confidence, and his children will have a refuge. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life that one may avoid the snares of death. 
second under that category is God's truth is to be pursued. Let me go back to chapter 1 again because it kind of sets the stage for the whole book. Chapter 1, and and looking at verse 29 through 33, uh, listen to this as a guideline of pursuing uh, wisdom, which, of course, is knowing God's will and living that will out. Because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, they they would not accept my counsel. They spurned all my reproof. So they shall eat of the fruit of their own way and be satisfied with their own devices. Sounds like Romans 1, 26 and 28, doesn't it? God help us. For the waywardness of the naive shall kill them, and the complacency of the fools shall destroy them. But he who listens to me shall live securely, and shall be at ease from the dread of evil. We're to pursue wisdom. You almost see chapter 15, verses 32 and 33, a very beautiful one also. Number three, the fear of the Lord leads to life. Chapter 14, 27, chapter 19, 23, chapter 22, 4. Second major category of practical principles for personal relationships is between man and his parents. How are we to deal with our parents? Um, That's a question I think it becomes very important. Children should learn from their parents. Chapter 1, verses 8 uh, through the rest of the chapter is very important of this. Chapter 4, verses 1 and following is very important. Reminds me a whole lot of Deuteronomy 6 where parents are to teach their children. And they're to meditate on the Lord as they, as they sit, as they get up, as they go on vacation. They're to share with their kids. 13.1 maybe is a good way to uh, characterize this rubric. A wise son accepts his father's discipline, but a scoffer does not listen to rebuke. Uh, A second aspect of this is children should not curse, assault, or rob their parents. Now, there's three categories, and I'll give you a scripture text for each. For number one, should not curse the parents. Uh, You ought to see chapter 20, verse 20, and chapter 30, verse 11 through 14. For assault a parent, to hit a parent, uh, 1926, and to rob a parent, 2824. Does that happen? Yes. Happened in the Old Testament, it happens today. It's a sign of really foolishness. Number three, children should bring joy to parents and not grief. Now, there are several of these. Let me let me just find one of them. Uh, Ten one would be a good one. A wise son makes a father glad, but a foolish son is grief to his mother. You might want to see chapter 15, verse 20, chapter 27, verse 11, chapter 29, 3 for the same truth. Should not bring grief to his parents. You might want to see uh, chapter 10, verse 1, of course, is that grief to his mother. You might want to see uh, chapter 17, verse 21 and 25, and chapter 19, 13. is another, uh, some good passages. Third major relationship uh, category would be between man and his wife. And I have several things here. I, I think Proverbs is one of those books that really gives us some guidelines about marriage, how we to treat our spouse. The first one is, Proverbs seems to support monogamy. Uh, married to one woman for life. You might want to see chapter 5, verses 15 through 23, which I think is an extended poem about uh, be faithful to the wife of your youth, watch out for sexual infidelity, uh, put your priority in your relationship with her. You ought to read chapter 5, 15 through 23. But I want to say something else here that I think is very important. And we'll turn to to, to Proverbs 17 with me because I, I think this is a excuse me, Proverbs 2, this is important enough that, that I think you, you're going to want to make sure you see this. Number one, I, I, I think that the marriage relationship is probably the best analogy for us to understand what it means to trust in God. Uh, we make some promises to Him. We're, we, there are some obligations. We learn more about Him through life. It's a lifelong thing. Isn't, isn't marriage like that? Listen to this. 17, 2, 17. Uh, he that leaves the companion of her youth and forgets the covenant of her God. You mean to, it's the idea that, that uh, sexual infidelity is breaking a covenant not only with a human being but with God? Yes. And this sexual fidelity is advocated so often in the Bible. Let me go down and just read 18 and 19 to follow up on that in chapter 2, verse 18 and 19. For her house sinks down to the earth, to death, and her tracks lead to the dead. Uh, none who go to her return again. They do not reach the paths of life. And it's talking about the strange woman or the adulterous woman. Uh, you might want to see chapter 6, verse 24, through chapter 7, verse 5, an extended literary unit on the tragedy of the prostitute. 
the, the, the lure in the heart of man to, uh, to, to sexual fulfillment outside marriage seems to be a recurrent problem through the ages. But fidelity is admonished, and infidelity is shown to be a source not only of folly, but of death and destruction. Boy, does our day need to hear that. The next one I think is important is the worth of a wife. My wife is uh, running the cameras as I tape these, and she's going to take notes on this, I know. Chapter 12, verse 4. An excellent wife is the crown of her husband, uh, but she who shames him is as rottenness to his bones. Isn't that something? Listen to this one. 1822. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. Don't you like that? Isn't that good, Peggy? Chapter 19, verse 14. House and wealth are an inheritance from your fathers, but a prudent wife is from the Lord. I believe that. And then, of course, that famous passage of chapter 31, verses 10 through 31, an extended poem about a, a, a faithful wife. Sounds more like an aggressive business partner to me when I read that. But anyway, it's the idea that it shows the equality of women. It shows the value of a godly, uh, a, a covenant-keeping wife. We need to hear that. Boy, there are so many things that think I pull our heart away from that. We need to think and remember the value of those people in our lives. Uh, number five, the sorrow of broken relationships. Uh, uh, 19, verse 13, and I'm going to read 21. This, this is a little bit humorous. Uh, I'm going to read 21, 9, and 19. There are several like this. It is better to live in the corner of a roof than in a house shared with a contentious woman. <laughs> and look at my, this is the 19. It is better to live in a desert land than with a contentious and vexing woman. And this, this same theme is also found in 2715. But you can, the same is true of a gripey old nagging husband too, isn't it? Amen, amen, I hear that, ladies. Uh, what that saying is, boy, these interpersonal relationships are so important. There can be joy and peace. The home can be the greatest thing this side of heaven, or it can be hell. We need to put priority time and energy on those relationships and may I say, on all relationship, because people are priority. The next major category about principles from Proverbs on personal relationships between a man and his children. Uh, Proverbs speaks a lot about the need to discipline our children. Chapter 10, verse 13. Chapter 13, verse 24. Chapter 15, verse 20, 32. Chapter 19, 18. 22, 6 and 15. 23, 14. 29, 15. Now, I want to read a couple of those, but do you, do you catch the, the, the thrust that discipline is something that's advocated in Proverbs? Now, now, don't be harsh. I think there's some New Testament Ephesians 6 guidelines for that, but listen to this. Here's 1324. He who spares his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him diligently. And let me turn over to 22.6 for the one you're very familiar with. Train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Yes, uh, there is a place for corporal punishment, and there is a place for reward. Yes. Uh, teach the fear of the Lord. I think chapter 14, verse 26 and 27 is one we looked at earlier. But I want to look at uh, chapter 15, verses 32 and 33 for, I think, a good, uh, beautiful example here. He who neglects discipline despises himself. But he who listens to reproof acquires understanding. The fear of the Lord is the instruction for wisdom, and before honor comes humility. Yes, we need to teach our children about the Lord. We do that, by the way, not by what we say only, but how we live. Now, the next major category be between a man and his relatives. It's surprising there's not more said about relatives. And, of course, relatives, the Hebrew word can mean a, a, a brother, an in-law, a cousin, a, an uncle. It says avoid strife, number one. Don't get into a fight with them, chapter 6, verse 19, chapter 19, verse 19. It says that a good friend is a good friend that's close is better than a relative that's far away. <laughs> I believe that, 1824 and 2710. Next major category, between a man and his covenant partner. Now, I've had to break this, as I showed you before, into two overlapping circles because there are people who are our covenant partners uh, that are not godly people. 
we need to relate to them differently than those who are walking with the Lord. Here's number one, is some positive guidelines on how to act with our covenant partner. Uh, first is chapter 10, verse 11. A good friend's like a fountain of life. Uh, then we have 12, 25. Uh, give help and guidance to your neighbor. I think that's helpful. Uh, then we have 17, 17. A friend loves at all times. Hmm. Then chapter 18, 24. A friend who stays closer than a brother. Boy, let's read that one. That is so beautiful. That's used often in the New Testament. A man of many friends comes to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Oh, my, how beautiful. Then chapter 27, verse 10. Um, and that, I, I quoted that earlier. It's a, a, a friend that's close is better than a brother far away. And now here's some negative aspects about how to relate to people who are maybe in the church or maybe like a covenant brother, but they don't act it. And you can certainly tell them by their fruits, Matthew chapter 7. Uh, first will be chapter 3, verse 27 through 30. Um, do not go after people and their evil plans. Don't listen to them. They say, let's go out and rob somebody and get a lot of money. Even if they claim to be a, a, in the covenant with Yahweh, don't do that. Uh, 1421 and chapter 26, verses 18 and 19. Uh, don't despise uh, your friend, your neighbor. And then chapter 17, 9. Don't gossip. Gossiping will break a friendship. Uh, 2517, don't visit too often nor stay too long in your neighbor's home. <laughs> I like the early saying of the church about, a, about visiting preachers. Uh, visiting preachers are like fish. If they stay longer than three days, they begin to smell. <laughs> That's a good word. Uh, chapter 27, verse 20, don't be lighthearted around someone in deep sorrow. That's a good thought. Now, maybe these little practical tidbits. This is not everything about interpersonal relationships. This is not a systematic theology about psychology, but it is some little guidelines. I heard Billy Graham say one time that he reads through the Psalms and the Proverbs the year around because it's some divine horse sense for, to guide a man's life. It's the only place in the Bible you can get this very succinct wisdom on how to deal with others. I, I think you ought to commit yourself to read Proverbs and to write down what you think it means in your life. I think the best way is to do it by themes because it gets confusing. Uh, but I think uh, it would really be helpful to you. I have a couple of closing remarks I want to make to kind of draw this together as best I can, though I know it's a very superficial discussion of such a large, broad topic, and I'm trying to limit myself somewhat to Proverbs. A, Proverbs emphasizing success, happiness, how to get wealth. But do you know that it also says and acknowledges that having less in the presence of love is better than great riches. Let's look at those. The first one is 15, 17. Better is a ditch of vegetables where there is love than a fattened ox and hatred with it. And also 17, 1, I think is so beautiful. Better is a dry morsel and quietness with it than a house full of feasting with strife. Now there's the balance we need to hear. Just having a lot of things doesn't mean you're going to be happy. Number two, Proverbs must be balanced with other parts of Scripture. There is a development from love your neighbor as yourself. Now, in, in the Old Testament, Leviticus uh, 18, 19, 18, it originally meant other Jews. But we hear that widened out in Jesus where he says, uh, uh, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. We see a widening out. We're moving in the Bible from love your neighbor as yourself to love your neighbor as I have loved you. Oh, now, folks, that's, that's a development. And we must see that tension as it develops, a progressive revelation from love that's maybe self-motivated to love that's truly self-giving. Again, John 3, 34. Uh, people are priority with God. Therefore, they must also be priority with his children. I guess the scripture text here that, that hits me the most is 1 John 4, 20 and 21. Matter of fact, I just want to look at that to make sure that you know I'm getting it from the scriptures and not off the top of my head. Listen to this now and think about your life. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For one who does not love his brother whom he has seen 
cannot love God whom he has seen. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. It's the idea where Jesus says, if you come to the altar and you have ought against your brother, leave your offering beside the altar. Go and be made right with your brother and then come sacrifice your offering to me. I think what he's saying is, how do you please God? How do you worship God? Not just in going to church, not just in giving tithes and offerings, not just in, in living a moral life. You know how you show you love God? You love other people made in his image, other people for whom he died, other people whom he loves and desires they come to know him and he wants to use you. That's where Christ's likeness comes in. It's true that God loves you, but God wants to love you to love the world through you. Interpersonal relationships are the key to life, are the key to happiness, are the key to doing the will of God. I've enjoyed being with you. I hope you'll think through this. Um, I know this is not extensive, but I hope it is a start to help you think on these things. God bless you. Have a good day.